Chapter Fifteen of The Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume Two, by Edgar Allan Poe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. The Pit and the Pendulum. Impiatotorum longos, hic turba furores sanguinis innocui non satiata aluit suspite nunc patria fracto nunc funeris antro mors ubi dira fuit vita salusque patent quatrain composed for the gates of a market to be erected upon the site of the jacobin clubhouse at paris i was sick sick unto death with that long agony and when they at length unbound me and i was permitted to sit i felt that my senses were leaving me the sentence the dread sentence of death was the last of distinct accentuation which reached my ears after that the sound of the inquisitorial voices seemed merged in one dreamy indeterminate hum it conveyed to my soul the idea of revolution perhaps from its association in fancy with the burr of a mill-wheel this only for a brief period for presently i heard no more yet for a while i saw but with how terrible an exaggeration i saw the lips of the black-robed judges they appeared to me white whiter than the sheet upon which i trace these words and thin even to grotesqueness thin with the intensity of their expression of firmness of immovable resolution of stern contempt of human torture i saw that the decrees of what to me was fate were still issuing from those lips i saw them writhe with a deadly locution i saw them fashion the syllables of my name and i shuddered because no sound succeeded i saw too for a few moments of delirious horror the soft and nearly imperceptible waving of the sable draperies which enwrapped the walls of the apartment and then my vision fell upon the seven tall candles upon the table at first they wore the aspect of charity and seemed white and slender angels who would save me but then all that once there came a most deadly nausea over my spirit and i felt every fibre in my frame thrill as if i had touched the wire of a galvanic battery while the angel forms became meaningless spectres with heads of flame and i saw that from them there would be no help and then there stole into my fancy like a rich musical note the thought of what sweet rest there must be in the grave the thought came gently and stealthily and it seemed long before it attained full appreciation oh, but just as my spirit came at length properly to feel and entertain it the figures of the judges vanished as if magically from before me the tall candles sank into nothingness their flames went out utterly the blackness of darkness supervened all sensations appeared swallowed up in a mad rushing descent as of the soul into hades then silence and stillness night were the universe i had swooned but still will not say that all of consciousness was lost 
what of it there remained i will not attempt to define or even to describe yet all was not lost in the deepest slumber no in delirium no in a swoon no in death no even in the grave all is not lost else there is no immortality for man arousing from the most profound of slumbers we break the gossamer web of some dream yet in a second afterward so frail may that web have been we remember not that we have dreamed in the return to life from the swoon there are two stages first that of the sense of mental or spiritual secondly that of the sense of physical existence it seems probable that if upon reaching the second stage we could recall the impressions of the first we should find these impressions eloquent in memories of the gulf beyond and that gulf is what how at least shall we distinguish its shadows from those of the tomb but if the impressions of what i have termed the first stage are not at will recalled yet after long interval do they not come unbidden while we marvel whence they come he who has never swooned is not he who finds strange palaces and wildly familiar faces in coals that glow is not he who beholds floating in mid-air the sad visions that the many may not view is not he who ponders over the perfume of some novel flower is not he whose brain grows bewildered with the meaning of some musical cadence which has never before arrested his attention amid frequent and thoughtful endeavours to remember amid earnest struggles to regather some token of the state of seeming nothingness into which my soul had lapsed there have been moments when i have dreamed of success there have been brief very brief periods when i have conjured up remembrances which the lucid reason of a later epoch assures me could have had reference only to that condition of seeming unconsciousness these shadows of memory tell indistinctly of tall figures that lifted and bore me in silence down down still down till a hideous dizziness oppressed me at the mere idea of the interminableness of the descent they tell also of a vague horror at my heart on account of that heart's unnatural stillness then comes a sense of sudden motionlessness throughout all things as if those who bore me a ghastly train had outrun in their descent the limits of the limitless and paused from the wearisomeness of their toil after this i call to mind flatness and dampness and then all is madness the madness of a memory which busies itself among forbidden things very suddenly there came back to my soul motion and sound the tumultuous motion of the heart and in my ears the sound of its beating then a pause in which all is blank then again sound and motion and touch a tingling sensation pervading my frame then the mere 
consciousness of existence without thought, a condition which lasted long. Then, very suddenly, thought, unshuddering terror, and earnest endeavour to comprehend my true state. Then, a strong desire to lapse into insensibility. Then, a rushing revival of soul, and a successful effort to move. And now, a full memory of the trial, of the judges, of the sable draperies, of the sentence, of the sickness, of the swoon. Then entire forgetfulness of all that followed, of all that a later day, and much earnestness of endeavour, have enabled me vaguely to recall. So far I had not opened my eyes. I felt that I lay upon my back, unbound. I reached out my hand, and it fell heavily upon something damp and hard. There I suffered it to remain for many minutes, while I strove to imagine where and what I could be. I longed, yet dared not to employ my vision. I dreaded the first glance at objects around me. It was not that I feared to look upon things horrible, but that I grew aghast, lest there should be nothing to see. At length, with a wild desperation at heart, I quickly unclosed my eyes. My worst thoughts, then, were confirmed. The blackness of eternal night encompassed me. I struggled for breath. The intensity of the darkness seemed to oppress and stifle me. The atmosphere was intolerably close. I still lay quietly, and made effort to exercise my reason. I brought to mind the inquisitorial proceedings, and attempted from that point to deduce my real condition. The sentence had passed, and it appeared to me that a very long interval of time had since elapsed, yet not for a moment did I suppose myself actually dead? Such a supposition, notwithstanding what we read in fiction, is altogether inconsistent with real existence. But where and in what state was I? The condemned to death, I knew, perished usually at the autos da fe, and one of these had been held on the very night of the day of my trial. Had I been remanded to my dungeon to await the next sacrifice, which would not take place for many months, this I at once saw could not be. Victims had been in immediate demand. Moreover, my dungeon, as well as all the condemned cells at Toledo, had stone floors, and light was not altogether excluded. Fearful idea, now suddenly drove the blood in torrents upon my heart, and for a brief period I once more relapsed into insensibility. Upon recovering, I at once started to my feet, trembling convulsively in every fibre. I thrust my arms wildly above and around me in all directions. I felt nothing, yet dreaded to move a step, lest I should be impeded by the walls of a tomb. Perspiration burst from every pore, and stood in cold big beads upon my forehead. The agony of suspense grew at length intolerable, and I cautiously moved forward with my arms extended, and my eyes straining from their sockets in the hope of catching some faint ray of light. I proceeded for many paces, but still all was blackness and vacancy. 
I breathed more freely. It seemed evident that mine was not at least the most hideous of fates. And now, as I still continued to step cautiously onward, there came thronging upon my recollection a thousand vague rumours of the horrors of Toledo. Of the dungeons there had been strange things narrated. Fables I had always deemed them, but yet strange and too ghastly to repeat, save in a whisper. Was I left to perish of starvation in this subterranean world of darkness? Or what fate, perhaps even more fearful, awaited me? That the result would be death, and a death of more than customary bitterness. I knew too well the character of my judges to doubt. The mode and the hour were all that occupied or distracted me. My outstretched hands at length encountered some solid obstruction. It was a wall, seemingly of stone masonry, very smooth, slimy and cold. I followed it up, stepping with all the careful distrust with which certain antique narratives had inspired me. This process, however, afforded me no means of ascertaining the dimensions of my dungeon, as I might make its circuit and return to the point whence I set out without being aware of the fact. So perfectly uniform seemed the wall. I therefore sought the knife which had been in my pocket when led into the inquisitorial chamber, but it was gone. My clothes had been exchanged for a wrapper of coarse serge. I had thought of forcing the blade in some minute crevice of the masonry, so as to identify my point of departure. The difficulty, nevertheless, was but trivial, although, in the disorder of my fancy, it seemed at first insuperable. I tore a part of the hem from the robe, and placed the fragment at full length and at right angles to the wall. In groping my way around the prison, I could not fail to encounter this rag upon completing the circuit. So, at least, I thought, but I had not counted upon the extent of the dungeon, or upon my own weakness. The ground was moist and slippery. I staggered onward for some time, when I stumbled and fell. My excessive fatigue induced me to remain prostrate and sleep soon overtook me as I lay. Upon awaking, and stretching forth an arm, I found beside me a loaf and a pitcher with water. I was too much exhausted to reflect upon this circumstance, but ate and drank with avidity. Shortly afterward, I resumed my tour around the prison, and with much toil, came at last upon the fragment of the surge. Up to the period when I fell, I had counted fifty-two paces, and upon resuming my walk, I had counted forty-eight more when I arrived at the rag. There were in all then a hundred paces, and, admitting two paces to the yard, I presumed the dungeon to be fifty yards in circuit. I had met, however, with many angles in the walls, and thus I could form no guess at the shape of the vault, for vault I could not help supposing it to be. I had little object, certainly no hope, in these researches, but a vague curiosity prompted me to continue them. Quitting the wall, I resolved to cross the area of the enclosure. At first 
I proceeded with extreme caution, for the floor, although seemingly of solid material, was treacherous with slime. At length, however, I took courage, and did not hesitate to step firmly, endeavouring to cross in as direct a line as possible. I had advanced some ten or twelve paces in this manner, when the remnant of the torn hem of my robe became entangled between my legs. I stepped on it, and fell violently on my face. In the confusion attending my fall, I did not immediately apprehend a somewhat startling circumstance, which yet, in a few seconds afterward, and while I still lay prostrate, arrested my attention. It was this. My chin rested upon the floor of the prison, but my lips on the upper portion of my head, although seemingly at a less elevation than the chin, touched nothing. At the same time, my forehead seemed bathed in a clammy vapour, and the peculiar smell of decayed fungus arose to my nostrils. I put forward my arm, and shuddered to find that I had fallen at the very brink of a circular pit, whose extent, of course, I had no means of ascertaining at the moment. Groping about the masonry just below the margin, I succeeded in dislodging a small fragment and let it fall into the abyss. For many seconds I hearkened to its reverberations as it dashed against the sides of the chasm in its descent. At length there was a sullen plunge into water, succeeded by loud echoes. At the same moment there came a sound resembling the quick opening and as rapid closing of a door overhead while a faint gleam of light flashed suddenly through the gloom, and as suddenly faded away. I saw clearly the doom which had been prepared for me, and congratulated myself upon the timely accident by which I had escaped. Another step before my fall, and the world had seen me no more, and the death just avoided was of that very character which I had regarded as fabulous and frivolous in the tales respecting the Inquisition. To the victims of its tyranny there was the choice of death with its direst physical agonies, or death with its most hideous moral horrors. I had been reserved for the latter. By long suffering my nerves had been unstrung, until I trembled at the sound of my own voice and had become, in every respect, a fitting subject for the species of torture which awaited me. Shaking in every limb, I groped my way back to the wall, resolving there to perish, rather than risk the terrors of the wells, of which my imagination now pictured many in various positions about the dungeon. In other conditions of mind, I might have had courage to end my misery at once by a plunge into one of these abysses, but now I was the veriest of cowards. Neither could I forget what I had read of these pits, that the sudden extinction of life formed no part of their most horrible plan. Agitation of spirit kept me awake for many long hours, but at length I again slumbered. Upon arousing, I found by my side, as before, a loaf and a pitcher of water. A burning thirst consumed me, and I emptied the vessel at a draught. It must have been drugged, for scarcely had I drunk before I became irresistibly drowsy. A deep sleep fell upon me, a sleep like that of death. How long it lasted, of course, I know not, 
but when once again I unclosed my eyes, the objects around me were visible. By a wild, sulphurous lustre, the origin of which I could not at first determine, I was enabled to see the extent and aspect of the prison. In its size I had been greatly mistaken. The whole circuit of its walls did not exceed twenty-five yards. For some minutes this fact occasioned me a world of vain trouble, of vain indeed, for what could be of less importance under the terrible circumstances which environed me than the mere dimensions of my dungeon. But my soul took a wild interest in trifles, and I busied myself in endeavours to account for the error I had committed in my measurement. The truth at length flashed upon me. In my first attempt at exploration, I had counted fifty-two paces, up to the period when I fell. I must then have been within a pace or two of the fragment of surge. In fact, I had nearly performed the circuit of the vault. I then slept and upon awaking I must have returned upon my steps, thus supposing the circuit nearly double what it actually was. My confusion of mind prevented me from observing that I began my tour with the wall to the left, and ended it with the wall to the right. I had been deceived, too, in respect to the shape of the enclosure, in feeling my way, I had found many angles, and thus deduced an idea of great irregularity. So potent is the effect of total darkness upon one arousing from lethargy or sleep. The angles were simply those of a few slight depressions or niches at odd intervals. The general shape of the prison was square. What I had taken for masonry seemed now to be iron or some other metal in huge plates whose sutures or joints occasioned the depression the entire surface of this metallic enclosure was rudely daubed in all the hideous and repulsive devices to which the charnel superstition of the monks has given rise the figures of fiends in aspects of menace with skeleton forms and other more really fearful images overspread and disfigured the walls i observed that the outlines of these monstrosities were sufficiently distinct but that the colours seemed faded and blurred as if from the effects of a damp atmosphere i now noticed the floor too which was of stone in the centre yawned the circular pit from whose jaws I had escaped, but it was the only one in the dungeon. All this I saw indistinctly and by much effort, for my personal condition had been greatly changed during slumber. I now lay upon my back, and at full length, on a species of low framework of wood, to this I was securely bound by a long strap, resembling a surcingle. It passed in many convolutions about my limbs and body, leaving at liberty only my head and my left arm, to such extent that I could, by dint of much exertion, supply myself with food from an earthen dish which lay by my side on the floor. I saw, to my horror, that the pitcher had been removed. I say to my horror, for I was consumed with intolerable thirst. This thirst it appeared to be the design of my persecutors to stimulate, for the food in the dish was meat, pungently seasoned. Looking upward, I surveyed the ceiling of my prison. It was some thirty or forty feet overhead and constructed much as the side walls. In one of its panels a very singular figure riveted my whole attention. It was the painted figure of time, 
as he is commonly represented, save that, in lieu of a scythe, he held what, at a casual glance, I supposed to be the pictured image of a huge pendulum, such as we see on antique clocks. There was something, however, in the appearance of this machine, which caused me to regard it more attentively. While I gazed directly upward at it, for its position was immediately over my own, I fancied that I saw it in motion. In an instant afterward, the fancy was confirmed. Its sweep was brief, and, of course, slow. I watched it for some minutes, somewhat in fear, but more in wonder. Wearied at length with observing its dull movement, I turned my eyes upon the other objects in the cell. A slight noise attracted my notice, and looking to the floor, I saw several enormous rats traversing it. They had issued from the well, which lay just within view to my right. Even then, while I gazed, they came up in troops, hurriedly, with ravenous eyes, allured by the scent of the meat. From this, it required much effort and attention to scare them away. It might have been half an hour, perhaps even an hour, for I could take but imperfect note of time, before I again cast my eyes upward. What I then saw confounded and amazed me. The sweep of the pendulum had increased in extent by nearly a yard. As a natural consequence, its velocity was also much greater but what mainly disturbed me was the idea that it had perceptibly descended. I now observed, with what horror it is needless to say, that its nether extremity was formed of a crescent of glittering steel, about a foot in length, from horn to horn, the horns upward, and the under edge, evidently as keen as that of a razor. Like a razor also, it seemed massy and heavy, tapering from the edge into a solid and broad structure above. It was appended to a weighty rod of brass, and the whole hissed as it swung through the air. I could no longer doubt the doom prepared for me by monkish ingenuity and torture. My cognizance of the pit had become known to the inquisitorial agents, the pit whose horrors had been destined for so bold a recusant as myself, the pit typical of hell, and regarded by rumour as the ultima thule of all their punishments. The plunge into this pit I had avoided by the merest of accidents. I knew that surprise or entrapment into torment formed an important portion of all the grotesquerie of these dungeon deaths. Having failed to fall, it was no part of the demon plan to hurl me into the abyss, and thus, there being no alternative, a different and a milder destruction awaited me. Oh, milder! I half smiled in my agony as I thought of such application of such a term. What boots it to tell of the long, long hours of horror more than mortal, during which I counted the rushing vibrations of the steel inch by inch, line by line, with a descent only appreciable at intervals that seemed ages, down and still down it came days passed it might have been that many days passed ere it swept so closely over me as to fan me with its acrid breath the odour of the sharp steel forced itself into my nostrils i prayed i wearied heaven with my prayer for its more speedy descent i grew frantically mad and struggled to force myself upward against the sweep of the fearful scimitar, and then I fell suddenly calm, and lay smiling 
at the glittering deck as a child at some rare bauble there was another interval of utter insensibility it was brief for upon again lapsing into life there had been no perceptible descent in the pendulum but it might have been long for i knew there were demons who took note of my swoon and who could have arrested the vibration at pleasure upon my recovery too i felt very oh inexpressibly sick and weak as if through long inanition even amid the agonies of that period the human nature craved food with painful effort i outstretched my left arm as far as my bonds permitted and took possession of the small remnant which had been spared me by the rats as i put a portion of it within my lips there rushed to my mind a half-formed thought of joy of hope yet what business had i with hope it was as i say a half-formed thought man has many such which are never completed i felt that it was of joy of hope but felt also that it had perished in its formation in vain i struggled to perfect to regain it long suffering had nearly annihilated all my ordinary powers of mind i was an imbecile an idiot the vibration of the pendulum was at right angles to my length i saw that the crescent was designed to cross the region of the heart it would fray the surge of my robe it would return and repeat its operations again and again notwithstanding terrifically wide sweep some thirty feet or more and the hissing vigour of its descent sufficient to sunder these very walls of iron still the fraying of my robe would be all that for several minutes it would accomplish and at this thought i paused i dared not go farther than this reflection i dwelt upon it with a pertinacity of attention as if in so dwelling i could arrest here the descent of the steel i forced myself to ponder upon the sound of the crescent as it should pass across the garment upon the peculiar thrilling sensation which the friction of cloth produces on the nerves i pondered upon all this frivolity until my teeth were on edge down steadily down it crept i took a frenzied pleasure in contrasting its downward with its lateral velocity to the right to the left far and wide with the shriek of a damned spirit to my heart with the stealthy pace of the tiger i alternately laughed and howled as the one or the other idea grew predominant down certainly relentlessly down it vibrated within three inches of my bosom i struggled violently furiously to free my left arm this was free only from the elbow to the hand I could reach the latter from the platter beside me to my mouth with great effort but no farther could i have broken the fastenings above the elbow i would have seized and attempted to arrest the pendulum i might as well have attempted to arrest an avalanche down still unceasingly still inevitably down i gasped and struggled at each vibration i shrank convulsively at its every sweep my eyes followed its outward or upward whirls with the eagerness of the most unmeaning despair they closed themselves spasmodically at the descent although death would have been a relief oh how unspeakable still i quivered in every nerve to think how slight a sinking of the machinery would precipitate that keen glistening axe upon my bosom it was hope that prompted the nerve to quiver the frame to shrink 
it was hope the hope that triumphs on the rack that whispers to the death condemned even in the dungeons of the inquisition i saw that some ten or twelve vibrations would bring the steel in actual contact with my robe and with this observation there suddenly came over my spirit all the keen collected calmness of despair for the first time during many hours or perhaps days i thought it now occurred to me that the bandage or surcingle which enveloped me was unique i was tied by no separate cord the first stroke of the razor-like crescent athwart any portion of the band would so detach it that it might be unwound from my person by means of my left hand but how fearful in that case the proximity of the steel the result of the slightest struggle how deadly was it likely moreover that the minions of the torturer had not foreseen and provided for this possibility was it probable that the bandage crossed my bosom in the track of the pendulum dreading to find my faint and as it seemed my last hope frustrated i so far elevated my head as to obtain a distinct view of my breast the surcingle enveloped my limbs and body close in all directions save in the path of the destroying crescent scarcely had i dropped my head back into its original position when there flashed upon my mind what i cannot better describe than as the unformed half of that idea of deliverance to which i have previously alluded and of which a moiety only floated indeterminately through my brain when i raised food to my burning lips the whole thought was now present feeble scarcely sane scarcely definite but still entire i proceeded at once with the nervous energy of despair to attempt its execution for many hours the immediate vicinity of the low framework upon which i lay had been literally swarming with rats they were wild bold ravenous their red eyes glaring upon me as if they waited but for motionlessness on my part to make me their prey to what food i thought have they been accustomed in the well they had devoured in spite of all my efforts to prevent them all but a small remnant of the contents of the dish i had fallen into an habitual seesaw or wave of the hand about the platter and at length the unconscious uniformity of the movement deprived it of effect in their voracity the vermin frequently fastened their sharp fangs in my fingers with the particles of the oily and spicy viand which now remained i thoroughly rubbed the bandage wherever i could reach it then raising my hand from the floor i lay breathlessly still at first the ravenous animals were startled and terrified at the change at the cessation of movement they shrank alarmedly back many sought the well but this was only for a moment i had not counted in vain upon their veracity observing that i remained without motion one or two of the boldest leaped upon the framework and smelt at the surcingle this seemed the signal for a general rush forth from the well they hurried in fresh troops they clung to the wood they overran it and leaped in hundreds upon my person the measured movement of the pendulum disturbed them not at all avoiding its strokes they busied themselves with the anointed bandage they pressed they swarmed upon me in ever accumulating heaps they writhed upon my throat their cold lips sought my own i was half stifled by their thronging pressure disgust for which the world had no name swelled my bosom and chilled with a heavy clamorous my heart yet one minute and i felt that the struggle would be over plainly 
i perceived the loosening of the bandage i knew that in more than one place it must be already severed with a more than human resolution i lay still nor had i erred in my calculations nor had i endured in vain i at length felt that i was free the surcingle hung in ribbons from my body but the stroke of the pendulum already pressed upon my bosom it had divided the serge of the robe it had cut through the linen beneath twice again it swung and a sharp sense of pain shot through every nerve but the moment of escape had arrived at a wave of my hand my deliverers hurried tumultuously away with a steady movement cautious sidelong shrinking and slow i slid from the embrace of the bandage and beyond the reach of the scimitar for the moment at least i was free free and in the grasp of the inquisition i had scarcely stepped from my wooden bed of horror upon the stone floor of the prison when the motion of the hellish machine ceased and i beheld it drawn up by some invisible force through the ceiling this was a lesson which i took desperately to heart my every motion was undoubtedly watched free i had but escaped death in one form of agony to be delivered unto worse than death in some other with that thought i rolled my eyes nervously around on the barriers of iron that hemmed me in something unusual some change which at first i could not appreciate distinctly it was obvious had taken place in the apartment for many minutes of a dreamy and trembling abstraction i busied myself in vain unconnected conjecture during this period i became aware for the first time of the origin of the sulphurous light which illumined the cell it proceeded from a fissure about half an inch in width extending entirely around the prison at the base of the walls which thus appeared and were completely separated from the floor i endeavoured but of course in vain to look through the aperture as i arose from the attempt the mystery of the alteration in the chamber broke at once upon my understanding i have observed that although the outlines of the figures upon the walls were sufficiently distinct yet the colours seemed blurred and indefinite these colours had now assumed and were momentarily assuming a startling and most intense brilliancy that gave to the spectral and fiendish portraitures an aspect that might have thrilled even firmer nerves than my own demon eyes of a wild and ghastly vivacity glared upon me in a thousand directions where none had been visible before and gleamed with the lurid lustre of a fire that i could not force my imagination to regard as unreal unreal even while i breathed there came to my nostrils the breath of the vapour of heated iron a suffocating odour pervaded the prison a deeper glow settled each moment in the eyes that glared at my agonies a richer tint of crimson diffused itself over the pictured horrors of blood i panted i gasped for breath there could be no doubt of the design of my tormentors o oh, most unrelenting o oh, most demonic of men i shrank from the glowing metal to the centre of the cell amid the thought of the fiery destruction that impended the idea of the coolness of the well came over my soul like balm i rushed to its deadly brink i threw my straining vision below the glare from the enkindled roof illumined its inmost recesses yet for a wild moment did my spirit refuse to comprehend the meaning of what i saw at length it forced it rustled its way into my soul it burned itself in upon my shuddering reason oh for a voice to speak oh horror oh any horror but this 
with a shriek i rushed from the margin and buried my face in my hands weeping bitterly the heat rapidly increased and once again i looked up shuddering as with a fit of the ague there had been a second change in the cell and now the change was obviously in the form as before it was in vain that i at first endeavoured to appreciate or understand what was taking place but not long was i left in doubt the inquisitorial vengeance had been hurried by my twofold escape and there was to be no more dallying with the king of terrors the room had been square i saw that two of its iron angles were now acute two consequently obtuse the fearful difference quickly increased with a low rumbling or moaning sound in an instant the apartment had shifted its form into that of a lozenge but the alteration stopped not here i neither hoped nor desired it to stop i could have clasped the red walls to my bosom as a garment of eternal peace death i said any death but that of the pit fool might i have not known that into the pit it was the object of the burning iron to urge me could i resist its glow or if even that could i withstand its pressure and now flatter and flatter grew the lozenge with a rapidity that left me no time for contemplation its centre and of course its greatest width came just over the yawning gulf i shrank back but the closing walls pressed me resistlessly onward at length for my seared and writhing body there was no longer an inch of foothold on the firm floor of the prison i struggled no more but the agony of my soul found vent in one loud long and final scream of despair i felt that i tottered upon the brink i averted my eyes there was a discordant hum of human voices there was a loud blast as of many trumpets there was a harsh grating as of a thousand thunders the fiery walls rushed back an outstretched arm caught my own as i fell fainting into the abyss it was that of general la salle the french army had entered toledo the inquisition was in the hands of its enemies End of chapter 15Chapter 16 of The Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 2, by Edgar Allan Poe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. The Premature Burial There are certain themes of which the interest is all-absorbing, but which are too entirely horrible for the purposes of legitimate fiction these the mere romanticist must eschew if he do not wish to offend or to disgust they are with propriety handled only when the severity and majesty of truth sanctify and sustain them we thrill for example with the most intense of pleasurable pain over the accounts of the passage of the Beresina, of the earthquake at Lisbon, of the plague at London, of the massacre of St. Bartholomew, or of the stifling of the hundred and twenty-three prisoners in the black hole at Calcutta. But in these accounts it is the fact, it is the reality, it is the history which excites. As inventions, we should regard them with simple abhorrence, i have mentioned some few of the more prominent and august calamities on record but in these it is the extent not less than the character of the calamity which so vividly impresses the fancy i need not remind the reader that from the long and weird catalogue of human miseries i might have selected many individual instances more replete with essential suffering 
than any of these vast generalities of disaster the true wretchedness indeed the ultimate woe is particular not diffuse that the ghastly extremes of agony are endured by man the unit and never by man the mass for this let us thank a merciful god to be buried while alive is beyond question the most terrific of these extremes which has ever fallen to the lot of mere mortality that it has frequently very frequently so fallen will scarcely be denied by those who think the boundaries which divide life from death are at best shadowy and vague who shall say where the one ends and where the other begins we know that there are diseases in which occur total cessations of all the apparent functions of vitality and yet in which these cessations are merely suspensions properly so called they are only temporary pauses in the incomprehensible mechanism a certain period elapses and some unseen mysterious principle again sets in motion the magic pinions and the wizard wheels the silver cord was not for ever loose nor the golden bowl irreparably broken but where meantime was the soul apart however from the inevitable conclusion a priori that such causes must produce such effects that the well-known occurrence of such cases of suspended animation must naturally give rise now and then to premature internments apart from this consideration we have the direct testimony of medical and ordinary experience to prove that a vast number of such internments have actually taken place i might refer at once if necessary to a hundred well-authenticated instances one of very remarkable character and of which the circumstances may be fresh in the memory of some of my readers occurred not very long ago in the neighbouring city of baltimore where it occasioned a painful intense and widely extended excitement the wife of one of the most respectable citizens a lawyer of eminence and a member of congress was seized with a sudden and unaccountable illness which completely baffled the skill of her physicians after much suffering she died or was supposed to die no one suspected indeed or had reason to suspect that she was not actually dead she presented all the ordinary appearances of death the face assumed the usual pinched and sunken outline the lips were of the usual marble pallor the eyes were lustreless there was no warmth pulsation had ceased for three days the body was preserved unburied during which it had acquired a stony rigidity the funeral in short was hastened on account of the rapid advance of what was supposed to be decomposition the lady was deposited in her family vault which for three subsequent years was undisturbed at the expiration of this term it was opened for the reception of a sarcophagus but alas how fearful a shock awaited the husband who personally threw open the door as its portal swung outwardly back some white apparelled object fell rattling within his arms it was the skeleton of his wife in her yet unmoulded shroud a careful investigation rendered it evident that she had revived within two days after her entombment that her struggles within the coffin had caused it to fall from a ledge or shelf to the floor where it was so broken as to permit her escape a lamp which had been accidentally left full of oil within the tomb 
was found empty it might have been exhausted however by evaporation on the uttermost of the steps which led down into the dread chamber was a large fragment of the coffin with which it seemed that she had endeavoured to arrest attention by striking the iron door while thus occupied she probably swooned or possibly died through sheer terror and in failing her shroud became entangled in some ironwork which projected interiorly thus she remained and thus she rotted erect in the year eighteen ten a case of living inhumation happened in france attended with circumstances which go far to warrant the assertion that truth is indeed stranger than fiction the heroine of the story was a mademoiselle victorine la Fourcade, a young girl of illustrious family of wealth and of great personal beauty among her numerous suitors was julian bosnet a poor literateur or journalist of paris his talents and general amiability had recommended him to the notice of the heiress by whom he seems to have been truly beloved but her pride of birth decided her finally to reject him and to wed a monsieur Aurenel, a banker and a diplomatist of some eminence after marriage however this gentleman neglected and perhaps even more positively ill-treated her having passed with him some wretched years she died at least her condition so closely resembled death as to deceive every one who saw her she was buried not in a vault but in an ordinary grave in the village of her nativity filled with despair and still inflamed by the memory of a profound attachment the lover journeys from the capital to the remote province in which the village lies with the romantic purpose of disinterring the corpse and possessing himself of its luxuriant tresses he reaches the grave at midnight he unearths the coffin opens it and is in the act of detaching the hair when he is arrested by the unclosing of the beloved eyes in fact the lady had been buried alive vitality had not altogether departed and she was aroused by the caresses of her lover from the lethargy which had been mistaken for death he bore her frantically to his lodgings in the village he employed certain powerful restoratives suggested by no little medical learning in fine she revived she recognized her preserver she remained with him until by slow degrees she fully recovered her original health her woman's heart was not adamant and this last lesson of love sufficed to soften it she bestowed it upon bosnet she returned no more to her husband but concealing from him her resurrection fled with her lover to america twenty years afterwards the two returned to france in the persuasion that time had so greatly altered the lady's appearance that her friends would be unable to recognize her they were mistaken however for at the first meeting monsieur renault did actually recognize and make claim to his wife this claim she resisted and a judicial tribunal sustained her in her resistance deciding that the peculiar circumstances with the long lapse of years had extinguished not only equitably but legally the authority of the husband the chirurgical journal of leipzig a periodical of high authority and merit which some american bookseller would do well to translate and republish records in a late number a very distressing event of the character in question an officer of artillery a man of gigantic stature and of robust health being thrown from an unmanageable horse received a very severe contusion upon the head which rendered him insensible at once the skull was slightly fractured 
but no immediate danger was apprehended. Trepanning was accomplished successfully. He was bled, and many other of the ordinary means of relief were adopted. Gradually, however, he fell into a more and more hopeless state of stupor, and finally it was thought that he died. The weather was warm, and he was buried with indecent haste in one of the public cemeteries. His funeral took place on Thursday. On the Sunday following, the grounds of the cemetery were, as usual, much thronged with visitors, and about noon an intense excitement was created by the declaration of a peasant that, while sitting upon the grave of the officer, he had distinctly felt a commotion of the earth, as if occasioned by someone struggling beneath. At first little attention was paid to the man's asseveration, but his evident terror and the dogged obstinacy with which he persisted in his story had at length their natural effect upon the crowd. Spades were hurriedly procured, and the grave, which was shamefully shallow, was in a few minutes so far thrown open that the head of its occupant appeared. He was then seemingly dead, but he sat nearly erect within his coffin, the lid of which, in his furious struggles, he had partially uplifted. He was forthwith conveyed to the nearest hospital, and there pronounced to be still living, although in an aspetic condition. After some hours he revived, recognized individuals of his acquaintance, and, in broken sentences, spoke of his agonies in the grave. From what he related, it was clear that he must have been conscious of life for more than an hour while inhumed before lapsing into insensibility. The grave was carelessly and loosely filled with an exceedingly porous soil, and thus some air was necessarily admitted. He heard the footsteps of the crowd overhead, and endeavoured to make himself heard in turn. It was the tumult within the grounds of the cemetery, he said, which appeared to awaken him from a deep sleep, but no sooner was he awake then he became fully aware of the awful horrors of his position. This patient, it is recorded, was doing well, and seemed to be in a fair way of ultimate recovery, but fell a victim to the quackeries of medical experiment. The galvanic battery was applied, and he suddenly expired in one of those ecstatic paroxysms which occasionally it superinduces. The mention of the galvanic battery, nevertheless, recalls to my memory a well-known and very extraordinary case in point, where its action proved the means of restoring to animation a young attorney of London, who had been interred for two days. This occurred in 1831, and created at the time a very profound sensation, wherever it was made the subject of converse. The patient, Mr. Edward Stapleton, had died apparently of typhus fever, accompanied with some anomalous symptoms which had excited the curiosity of his medical attendants. Upon his seeming decease, his friends were requested to sanction a post-mortem examination, but declined to permit it. As often happens when such refusals are made, the practitioners resolved to disinter the body and dissect it at leisure in private. Arrangements were easily effected with some of the numerous corps of body-snatchers with which London abounds, and upon the third night after the funeral the supposed corpse was unearthed from a grave eight feet deep and deposited in the opening chamber of one of the private hospitals. An incision of some extent had been actually made in the abdomen, when the fresh and undecayed appearance of the subject suggested an application of the battery. One experiment succeeded another, and the customary effect supervened, with nothing to characterize them in any respect, except, upon one or two occasions, a more than ordinary degree of life-likeness in the convulsive action. It grew late, the day was about to dawn, 
and it was thought expedient at length to proceed at once to the dissection a student however was especially desirous of testing a theory of his own and insisted upon applying the battery to one of the pectoral muscles a rough gash was made and a wire hastily brought in contact when the patient with a hurried but quite unconvulsive movement arose from the table stepped into the middle of the floor gazed about him uneasily for a few seconds and then spoke what he said was unintelligible but words were uttered the syllabification was distinct having spoken he fell heavily to the floor for some moments all were paralyzed with awe but the urgency of the case soon restored them their presence of mind it was seen that mr stapleton was alive although in a swoon upon exhibition of ether he revived and was rapidly restored to health and to the society of his friends from whom however all knowledge of his resuscitation was withheld until a relapse was no longer to be apprehended their wonder their rapturous astonishment may be conceived the most thrilling peculiarity of this incident nevertheless is involved in what mr s himself asserts he declares that at no period was he altogether insensible that dully and confusedly he was aware of everything which happened to him from the moment in which he was pronounced dead by his physicians to that in which he fell swooning to the floor of the hospital i am alive were the uncomprehended words which upon recognizing the locality of the dissecting room he had endeavoured in his extremity to utter it were an easy matter to multiply such histories as these but i forbear for indeed we have no need of such to establish the fact that premature internments occur when we reflect how very rarely from the nature of the case we have it in our power to detect them we must admit that they may frequently occur without our cognizance scarcely in truth is a graveyard ever encroached upon for any purpose to any great extent that skeletons are not found in postures which suggest the most fearful of suspicions fearful indeed the suspicion but more fearful the doom it may be asserted without hesitation that no event is so terribly well adapted to inspire the supremeness of bodily and of mental distress as is burial before death the unendurable oppression of the lungs the stifling fumes from the damp earth the clinging to the death garments the rigid embrace of the narrow house the blackness of the absolute night the silence like a sea that overwhelms the unseen but palpable presence of the conqueror worm these things with the thoughts of the air and grass above with memory of dear friends who would fly to save us if but informed of our fate and with consciousness that of this fate they can never be informed that our hopeless portion is that of the really dead these considerations i say carry into the heart which still palpitates a degree of appalling and intolerable horror from which the most daring imagination must recoil we know of nothing so agonizing upon earth we can dream of nothing half so hideous in the realms of the nethermost hell and thus all narratives upon this topic have an interest profound an interest nevertheless which through the sacred awe of the topic itself very properly and very peculiarly depends upon our conviction of the truth of the matter narrated what i have now to tell is of my own actual knowledge of my own positive and personal experience for several years i had been subject to attacks of the singular disorder which physicians have agreed to term catalepsy 
in default of a more definitive title although both the immediate and the predisposing causes and even the actual diagnosis of this disease are still mysterious its obvious and apparent character is sufficiently well understood its variations seem to be chiefly of degree sometimes the patient lies for a day only or even for a shorter period in a species of exaggerated lethargy he is senseless and externally motionless but the pulsation of the heart is still faintly perceptible some traces of warmth remain a slight colour lingers within the centre of the cheek and upon application of a mirror to the lips we can detect a torpid unequal and vacillating action of the lungs then again the duration of the trance is for weeks even for months while the closest scrutiny and the most rigorous medical tests fail to establish any material distinction between the state of the sufferer and what we conceive of absolute death very usually he is saved from premature internment solely by the knowledge of his friends that he has been previously subject to catalepsy by the consequent suspicion excited and above all by the non-appearance of decay the advances of the malady are luckily gradual the first manifestations although marked are unequivocal the fits grow successively more and more distinctive and endure each for a longer term than the preceding in this lies the principal security from inhumation the unfortunate whose first attack should be of the extreme character which is occasionally seen would almost inevitably be consigned alive to the tomb my own case differed in no important particular from those mentioned in medical books sometimes without any apparent cause i sank little by little into a condition of hemi syncope or half swoon and in this condition without pain without ability to stir or strictly speaking to think but with a dull lethargic consciousness of life and of the presence of those who surrounded my bed i remained until the crisis of the disease restored me suddenly to perfect sensation at other times i was quickly and impetuously smitten i grew sick and numb and chilly and dizzy and so fell prostrate at once then for weeks all was void and black and silent and nothing became the universe total annihilation could be no more from these latter attacks i awoke however with a gradation slow in proportion to the suddenness of the seizure just as the day dawns to the friendless and houseless beggar who roams the streets throughout the long desolate winter night just so tardily just so wearily just so cheerily came back the light of the soul to me apart from the tendency to trance however my general health appeared to be good nor could i perceive that it was at all affected by the one prevalent malady unless indeed an idiosyncrasy in my ordinary sleep may be looked upon as superinduced upon awaking from slumber i could never gain at once thorough possession of my senses and always remained for many minutes in much bewilderment and perplexity the mental faculties in general but the memory in especial being in a condition of absolute abeyance in all that i endured there was no physical suffering but of moral distress an infinitude my fancy grew charnel i talked of worms of tombs and epitaphs i was lost in reveries of death and the idea of premature burial held continual possession of my brain the ghastly danger to which i was subjected haunted me day and night 
in the former the torture of meditation was excessive in the latter supreme when the grim darkness overspread the earth then with every horror of thought i shook shook as the quivering plumes upon the hearse when nature could endure wakefulness no longer it was with a struggle that i consented to sleep for i shuddered to reflect that upon awaking i might find myself the tenant of a grave and when finally i sank into slumber it was only to rush at once into a world of phantasms above which with vast sable overshadowing wing hovered predominant the one sepulchral idea from the innumerable images of gloom which thus oppressed me in dreams i select for record but a solitary vision methought i was immersed in a cataleptic trance of more than usual duration and profundity suddenly there came an icy hand upon my forehead and an impatient gibbering voice whispered the word arise within my ears i sat erect the darkness was total i could not see the figure of him who had aroused me i could call to mind neither the period at which i had fallen into the trance nor the locality in which i then lay while i remained motionless and busied in endeavours to collect my thought the cold hand grasped me fiercely by the wrist shaking it petulantly while the gibbering voice said again arise did i not bid thee arise and who i demanded art thou i have no name in the regions which i inhabit replied the voice mournfully i was mortal but am fiend i was merciless but am pitiful thou dost feel that i shudder my teeth chatter as i speak yet it is not with the chilliness of the night of the night without end but this hideousness is insufferable how canst thou tranquilly sleep i cannot rest for the cry of these great agonies all oh, these sights are more than i can bear get thee up come with me into the outer night and let me unfold to thee the grave is not this a spectacle of woe behold i looked and the unseen figure which still grasped me by the wrist had caused to be thrown open the graves of all mankind and from each issued the faint phosphoric radiance of decay so that i could see into the innermost recesses and there view the shrouded bodies and their sad and solemn slumbers with the worm but alas the real sleepers were fewer by many millions than those who slumbered not at all and there was a feeble struggling and there was a general sad unrest and from out the depths of the countless pits there came a melancholy rustling from the garments of the buried and of those who seemed tranquilly to repose i saw that a vast number had changed in a greater or lesser degree the rigid and uneasy position in which they had originally been entombed and the voice again said to me as i gazed is it not oh is it not a pitiful sight but before i could find words to reply the figure had ceased to grasp my wrist the phosphoric lights expired and the graves were closed with a sudden violence while from out them arose a tumult of despairing cries saying again is it not oh god is it not a very pitiful sign fantasies such as these presenting themselves at night extended their terrific influence far into my waking hours my nerves became thoroughly unstrung and i fell a prey to perpetual horror i hesitated to ride or to walk or to indulge in any exercise that would carry me from home in fact i no longer dared trust myself out of the immediate presence of those who were aware of my proneness to catalepsy lest falling into one of my usual fits i should be buried 
before my real condition could be ascertained. I doubted the care, the fidelity of my dearest friends. I dreaded that, in some trance of more than customary duration, they might be prevailed upon to regard me as irrecoverable. I even went so far as to fear that, as I occasioned much trouble, they might be glad to consider any very protracted attack a sufficient excuse for getting rid of me altogether. It was in vain they endeavoured to reassure me by the most solemn promises. I exacted the most sacred oaths that under no circumstances they would bury me until decomposition had so materially advanced as to render farther preservation impossible. And even then my mortal terrors would listen to no reason, would accept no consolation. I entered into a series of elaborate precautions. Among other things, I had the family vault so remodelled as to admit of being readily opened from within. The slightest pressure upon a long lever that extended far into the tomb would cause the iron portal to fly back. There were arrangements also for the free admission of air and light, and convenient receptacles for food and water within immediate reach of the coffin intended for my reception. This coffin was warmly and softly padded, and was provided with a lid fashioned upon the principle of the vault door, with the addition of springs so contrived that the feeblest movement of the body would be sufficient to set it at liberty. Besides all this, there was suspended from the roof of the tomb a large bell, the rope of which it was designed should extend through a hole in the coffin, and so be fastened to one of the hands of the corpse. But, alas, what avails the vigilance against the destiny of man? Not even these well-contrived securities suffice to save from the uttermost agonies of living inhumation a wretch to those agonies foredoomed. There arrived an epoch, as often before there had arrived, in which I found myself emerging from total unconsciousness into the first feeble and indefinite sense of existence. Slowly, with a tortoise gradation, approached the faint grey dawn of the cycle day. A torpid uneasiness, an apathetic endurance of dull pain. No care, no hope, no effort. Then, after a long interval, a ringing in the ears. Then, after a lap still longer, a prickling or tingling sensation in the extremities. Then, a seemingly eternal period of pleasurable quiescence, during which the awakening feelings are struggling into thought. Then, a brief resinking into non-entity. Then, a sudden recovery. At length, the slight quivering of an eyelid, and immediately thereupon, an electric shock of a terror, deadly and indefinite, which sends the blood in torrents from the temples to the heart. And now, the first positive effort to think. And now, the first endeavour to remember. And now, a partial and evanescent success. And now, the memory has so far regained its dominion that, in some measure, I am cognizant of my state. I feel that I am not awaking from ordinary sleep. I recollect that I have been subject to catalepsy, and now, at last, as if by the rush of an ocean, my shuddering spirit is overwhelmed by the one grim danger, by the one spectral and ever-prevalent idea. For some minutes after this fancy possessed me, I remained without motion, and why? I could not summon courage to move. I dared not make the effort which was to satisfy me of my fate, and yet there was something at my heart which whispered me it was sure. Despair, such as no other species of wretchedness ever calls into being, despair alone urged me, after long irresolution, to uplift the heavy lids of my eyes. I uplifted them. It was dark, all dark. I knew that the fit was over. I knew that the crisis of my disorder had long passed. I knew that I had now fully recovered 
the use of my visual faculties and yet it was dark all dark the intense and utter raylessness of the night that endureth for evermore i endeavoured to shriek and my lips and my parched tongue moved convulsively together in the attempt but no voice issued from the cavernous lungs which oppressed as if by the weight of some incumbent mountain gasped and palpitated with the heart at every elaborate and struggling inspiration the movement of the jaws in this effort to cry aloud showed me that they were bound up as is usual with the dead i felt too that i lay upon some hard substance and by something similar my sides were also compressed so far i had not ventured to stir any of my limbs but now i violently threw up my arms which had been lying at length with the wrists crossed they struck a solid wooden substance which extended above my person at an elevation of not more than six inches from my face i could no longer doubt that i reposed within a coffin at last and now amid all my infinite miseries came sweetly the cherub hope for i thought of my precautions i writhed and made spasmodic exertions to force open the lid it would not move i felt my wrists for the bell rope it was not to be found and now the comforter fled for ever and a still sterner despair reigned triumphant for i could not help perceiving the absence of the paddings which i had so carefully prepared and then too there came suddenly to my nostrils the strong peculiar odour of moist earth the conclusion was irresistible i was not within the vault i had fallen into a trance while absent from home while among strangers when or how i could not remember and it was they who had buried me as a dog nailed up in some common coffin and thrust deep deep and for ever into some ordinary and nameless grave as this awful conviction forced itself thus into the innermost chambers of my soul i once again struggled to cry aloud and in this second endeavour i succeeded a long wild and continuous shriek or yell of agony resounded through the realms of the subterranean night hello hello there said a gruff voice in reply what the devil's the matter now said a second get out of that said a third what do you mean by yowling in that ere kind of style like a catamount said a fourth and hereupon i was seized and shaken without ceremony for several minutes by a junto of very rough-looking individuals they did not arouse me from my slumber for i was wide awake when i screamed but they restored me to the full possession of my memory this adventure occurred near richmond in virginia accompanied by a friend i had proceeded upon a gunning expedition some miles down the banks of the james river night approached and we were overtaken by a storm the cabin of a small sloop lying at anchor in the stream and laden with garden mould afforded us the only available shelter we made the best of it and passed the night on board i slept in one of the only two berths in the vessel and the berths of a sloop of sixty or twenty tons need scarcely be described that which i occupied had no bedding of any kind its extreme width was eighteen inches the distance of its bottom from the deck overhead was precisely the same i found it a matter of exceeding difficulty to squeeze myself in nevertheless i slept soundly and the whole of my vision for it was no dream and no nightmare arose naturally from the circumstances of my position from my ordinary bias of thought and from the difficulty to which i have alluded of collecting my senses and especially of regaining my memory for a long time after awaking from slumber the men who shook me were the crew of the sloop and some labourers engaged to unload it from the load itself came the earthly smell the bandage about the jaws was a silk handkerchief in which i had bound up my head 
in default of my customary nightcap the tortures endured however were indubitably quite equal for the time to those of actual sepulture they were fearfully they were inconceivably hideous but out of evil proceeded good for their very excess wrought in my spirit an inevitable revulsion my soul acquired tone acquired temper i went abroad i took vigorous exercise i breathed the free air of heaven i thought upon other subjects than death i discarded my medical books a bucken i burned i read no night thoughts no fustian about churchyards no bugaboo tales such as this in short i became a new man and lived a man's life from that memorable night i dismissed for ever my charnel apprehensions and with them vanished the cataleptic disorder of which perhaps they had been less the consequence than the cause there are moments when even to the sober eye of reason the world of our sad humanity may assume the semblance of a hell but the imagination of man is no carathis to explore with impunity its every cavern alas the grim legion of sepulchral terrors cannot be regarded as altogether fanciful but like the demons in whose company aphrasiab made his voyage down the oxus they must sleep or they will devour us they must be suffered to slumber or we perish end of chapter sixteen